My name is Erica, and I am another one of your ISAs. So now that Chad has shown us through processing the object, sketching it in elevation, measuring it, dimensioning it, I will introduce you to Rhino and walk you through the making of the elevation, the drafting of the elevation. So when you open Rhino, you will see something along these lines. Mac looks a bit different, but the PC should look pretty similar. I have a few extra panels, but it's pretty much the same. So walking you through, we have this top panel, this top menu bar here, and this just has the commands that you use in Rhino, but in text form with a few different options in there. These are good to just explore at your leisure. And yeah, the most important part of Rhino for me is this typing area, and that's because in Rhino you type any command that you want. You can go through and find it in here, but that's really slow, and you are most efficient if you learn how to type your commands. You don't have to click into this bar to start typing. You can just be working and then start typing your command, such as line, which will let me draw a line. So Rhino is a pretty intuitive program that way, and anything that you want to do, you can try just typing it and then seeing if it's already a command. And if not, you can try Googling it, or and one of those two will work. So one other thing about Rhino is that you should use a mouse. They have really cheap wired mice, and it makes your workflow a lot easier and just faster in general. They probably also have cheap wireless mice, so I would definitely invest in one, a mouse. So we went through the typing area. You can also see your past commands and what's been happening up here. So if you scroll up, you can also open that up and see more of it. It depends on how you like to set your workspace up. Right under that text bar, we have these categories this category menu situation. And when you click on each one, they show this row of icons that changes. And when you hover over one of these icons, it will give you the name of the command it's trying to, the command it like refers to. And sometimes you can do a right click for a different but related command. And this is an area that's great to explore especially if you're not sure how to do something that you want to do or you're just curious one day. That's how I found that learning Rhino works best. You just mess around and figure it out without too much structure, I guess. So going into that, we have this menu on the left right here, which changes a bit with the menu we just talked about. And this is just more buttons for your commands. And the reason that I say you should type instead of find the buttons is it's just significantly faster and will help your workflow in the long run. One thing that is different about these buttons over here versus the buttons up along the top are these corner pieces where they expand to this new menu here with a bunch of different options. And on the right side of the screen, we have the properties tab, which is this rainbow circle situation. And that tells you about your viewport, camera, target length, etc. And next to that, we have the layers tab. And this is the one that we'll be using the most today and the one that's pretty much the most important because it helps you manage your grouping of lines and objects in your Rhino file. So let's open this up a bit. There's a few different options in here. As you can see, these are just some default ones that they give us and they have different colors here. You can change these colors by double clicking on the square and just opening it up, changing the color, whatever you wanna do. Notice this also changed the diamond over here. This is actually the print color box and so when you're printing, just be aware of what this is set to. I'll just set that one to black. And then this checkbox here, next to default, means that it's the active layer. 
So if I go into top and I draw a line, then you see it's black. But if I switch my active layer to layer three and draw another line, then you can see that it's blue. And then when I hide the default layer with this light bulb here, it hides all of the lines on that layer. And then if I lock it, then the only one that will be selected is this blue one. One thing about selections in Rhino is you can drag right to left, and that will select everything that your box intersects with. But if you drag left to right, then it will only it will only select what is entirely encapsulated by your box, your selection box. So that comes in handy once you get more used to Rhino. I'll delete these and go back to this for view. This other option up here is rendering and we don't have to worry about that. If you're ever missing one of your panels or menu bars, then you can go up to this panels option up here and find it and then bring it back out by just clicking it. Yeah. So now that we have explored all the toolbars, let's take a look at the viewports. Initially, it shows you this four viewport view, and you can tell which viewport is active because it's highlighted in blue. So if I click into top, then top is highlighted, but if I'm in right side, then that's highlighted as well. And then, so if we go into top, you can navigate the screen by scrolling in and out with your mouse. And then to pan, you just use your, press and hold your right mouse key, right mouse, right a mouse button, and shifting into perspective, the 3D view, we orbit with the same command, holding that right mouse key button and moving it around. So to pan, you press shift and then move around with your right mouse button. And you can play around with locking and stuff, but we won't need that until later. So you have your top, front, and right, and these are useful for when you're drawing in 3D space or modeling in 3D space. But today we'll just be focusing on our top direction. And to move between these, you just double click on the name of it. So I'm double clicking on top to enter and double clicking on it again to get back to this four square view. One thing you can also do is adjust the size of each of the boxes to fit whatever you're working on at the moment. And you can even have multiple top views at the same time. So to get another top view or to just reset the view that you're at, you can click into this menu here and go down to set view and click top. And so now I have just two top views for whatever reason I'd want. And a little bit more things about this drop down menu. These over here describe the display mode that you're in and since we'll be focusing on 2D drawing this quarter we really it doesn't matter which one you're in the lines look the same in all of them so we're just going to wireframe for now so now that we have explored Rhino a bit the interface we can start setting it up for our project so if you go down here you notice that we are working in millimeters this is where you can find what units you're working in and to change units, you can just type units. We want to be in inches because that's probably what you're measuring in. And so after I've typed units and press enter, it'll ask me what I want to do with the model units and I'm gonna go down to inches. That says feet and I want inches, great. And then press okay. And I'm pressing yes on that one, but I have no lines on my page, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. Down here, you can also see these options at the bottom, and they're pretty self-explanatory. I would spend a few minutes playing around with them. Grid snap, so if I have grid snap on, then my pointer snaps to the grid. Ortho, the lines are stuck in the orthogonal directions, and if I press shift, then I, it's a free line. And that is vice versa with 
ortho being off, you can have a free line, but then when you press shift, it's locked to those orthogonal directions. I keep planar on because sometimes Rhino likes to draw in 3D and when I want to, it to draw in 2D. So planar helps keep it flat and on the same plane. And then O-Snap controls these things over here, these options here, end, near, point, mid, center, etc. And I always keep my O-Snaps on. The most important ones for you will be end and mid, and the rest are for you to play around with. I, these are the ones that I do keep on, so take what you will from that. The one that causes issues sometimes is this center point, center object snap, and that will kind of move your cursor when you don't want it to, to snap to the center of an object, even if you didn't want to snap to that center. So I usually toggle that on when I need it and off when I don't need it. The last thing in this menu down here is the gumball. And the gumball refers to this thing with the green arrow and the red arrow and the blue arc. And this just gives you some control over whatever object is selected. So I drew this line here and you can use these to move precise amounts by typing in the amount of space the amount of distance you want to travel or the angle that you want your thing to rotate to. Another thing that you can do with the gumball is scale things loosely. And yeah, by just dragging these. And then if you press shift, it scales it as one unit. So that is the gumball. Some people have it off and that's what it looks like when it's off. I don't know why you would want that. So I keep it on all the time because it helps me drag and move my things with precision when I use numbers and without precision when I just drag it around. So a few more things about layers before we begin is that you can rename them by double clicking until you see this kind of interface thing. And you can also create new ones by going up to this new layer button and renaming this. This one will be shelf. And then you can also say you draw a line in shelf and then you want to convert it to layer four. You would see two or copy object to layer and now it is in, I copied, no, I changed the layer and now it's in layer four, but I will delete that. So. In front of me, I have the object, the red lamp, and a ruler, and the sketches that Chad did with the dimensions on them. And I have the object in front of me just for reference and in case I need any additional measurements as we go, but it's important to have the first ones, the major ones down before we begin. So to begin, we will just start with the big dimensions, big primitives, and work our way down to more detailed portions of it, adding more and more detail as we go. And I'll show you a few rings to to start out with. So the first one that I'll show you is making just a line. And so you can either, I'm holding down shift to make it lock into this orthogonal direction. And you can either um, draw a line at a random length, or you can type in, say, I want this one to be four inches long, and there it is, four inches long. There are two ways you can check the length of things. So if you want the distance from point to point, you can type distance, and then that will give you your distance. And you can also click on a line and type length, but when you have a polyline, which I'll explain in a second, that's a chain of lines that's all joined and connected into one long thing. That'll give you the length of the whole thing, not just that segment that you're looking at. So now that we've covered line, we'll do polyline. So typing polyline, and it's pretty much the same as a line, except you can continuously draw with it. So I'll make this first one two, press enter, hold shift, and click, and that drops that end point. And then maybe this next one is three 
and we'll go up here just like that. You can also just click randomly until it comes together into a line like that.